Five Weeks in a Balloon, or Journeys and Discoveries in Africa by Three Englishmen, by Jules Verne, translated by William Lackland. Chapter 1. The End of a Much Applauded Speech, The Presentation of Dr. Samuel Ferguson, Excelsior, Full-Length Portrait of the Doctor, A Fatalist Convinced, A Dinner at the Travelers' Club, Several Toasts for the Occasion. There was a large audience assembled on the 14th of January, 1862, at the session of the Royal Geographical Society, No. 3 Waterloo Palace, London. The President, Sir Francis M., made an important communication to his colleagues in an address that was frequently interrupted by applause. This rare specimen of eloquence terminated with the following sonorous phrases bubbling over with patriotism. England has always marched at the head of nations for, the reader will observe, the nations always march at the head of each other, by the intrepidity of her explorers in the line of geographical discovery, General Assent. Dr. Samuel Ferguson, one of her most glorious sons, will not reflect discredit on his origin. No, indeed, from all parts of the hall. This attempt, should it succeed, it will succeed, will complete and link together the notions, as yet disjointed, which the world entertains of African cartology, vehement applause, and should it fail, it will at least remain on record as one of the most daring conceptions of human genius, tremendous cheering. Huzzah! Huzzah! shouted the immense audience, completely electrified by these inspiring words. Huzzah! for the intrepid Ferguson! cried one of the most excitable of the enthusiastic crowd. The wildest cheering resounded on all sides. The name of Ferguson was in every mouth, and we may safely believe that it lost nothing in passing through English throats. Indeed, the hall fairly shook with it. And there were present also those fearless travellers and explorers, whose energetic temperaments had borne them through every quarter of the globe, many of them grown old and worn out in the service of science. All had, in some degree, physically or morally, undergone the sorest trials. They had escaped shipwreck, conflagration, Indian tomahawks and war clubs, the faggot and the stake, nay, even the cannibal maws of the South Sea Islanders. But still their hearts beat high during Sir Francis M.'s address, which certainly was the finest oratorical success that the Royal Geographical Society of London had yet achieved. But in England, enthusiasm does not stop short with mere words. It strikes off money faster than the dyes of the Royal Mint itself. So subscription to encourage Dr. Ferguson was voted there and then, and it at once attained the handsome amount of two thousand five hundred pounds. The sum was made commensurate with the importance of the enterprise. A member of the society then inquired of the president whether Dr. Ferguson was not to be officially introduced. The doctor is at the disposition of the meeting, replied Sir Francis. Let him come in, then. Bring him in, shouted the audience. We'd like to see a man of such extraordinary daring, face to face. Perhaps this incredible proposition of his is only intended to mystify us, growled an apoplectic old admiral. Suppose that there should turn out to be no such person as Dr. Ferguson, exclaimed another voice with a malicious twang. Why, then, we'd have to invent one, replied a facetious member of this grey society. Ask Dr. Ferguson to come in, was the quiet remark of Sir Francis M. And come in, the doctor did, and stood there, quite unmoved by the thunders of applause that greeted his appearance. He was a man of about forty years of age, of medium height and physique. His sanguine temperament was disclosed in the deep color of his cheeks. His countenance was coldly expressive, with regular features, and a large nose, one of those noses that resemble the prow of a ship, and stamp the faces of men predestined to accomplish great discoveries. His eyes, which were gentle and intelligent rather than bold, lent a peculiar charm to his physiognomy. His arms were long, and his feet were planted with that solidity which indicates a great pedestrian. A calm gravity seemed to surround the doctor's entire person, and no one would dream that he would become the agent of any mystification, however harmless. Hence the applause that greeted him at the outset continued until he, with a friendly gesture, claimed silence on his own behalf. He stepped towards the seat that had been prepared for him on his presentation, and then, standing erect and motionless, he, with a determined glance, pointed his right forefinger upward and pronounced aloud the single word, Excelsior! Never had one of Bright's or Cobden's sudden onslaughts, never had one of Palmerston's abrupt demands for funds to plate the rocks of the English coast with iron, made such a sensation. 
Sir Francis M.'s address was completely overshadowed. The doctor had shown himself moderate, sublime, and self-contained. In one, he had uttered the word of the situation, Excelsior! The gouty old admiral who had been finding fault was completely won over by the singular man before him, and immediately moved the insertion of Dr. Ferguson's speech in The Proceedings of the Royal Geographical Society of London. Who then was this person, and what was the enterprise that he proposed? Ferguson's father, a brave and worthy captain in the English navy, had associated his son with him, from the young man's earliest years, in the perils and adventures of his profession. The fine little fellow, who seemed to have never known the meaning of fear, early revealed a keen and active mind, an investigating intelligence, and a remarkable turn for scientific study. Moreover, he disclosed uncommon address in extricating himself from difficulty. He was never perplexed, not even in handling his fork for the first time, an exercise in which children generally have so little success. His fancy kindled early at the recitals he heard of daring enterprise and maritime adventure, and he followed with enthusiasm the discoveries that signalized the first part of the nineteenth century. He mused over the glory of the Mungo Parks, the Bruces, the Cayleys, the Lavalants, and to some extent, I verily believe, of Selkirk, Robinson Crusoe, whom he considered in no wise inferior to the rest. How many a well-employed hour he passed with that hero on his isle of Juan Fernandez. Often he criticized the ideas of the shipwrecked sailor, and sometimes discussed his plans and projects. He would have done differently in such and such a case, or quite as well as at least, of that he felt assured. But of one thing he was satisfied, that he never should have left that pleasant island, where he was as happy as a king without subjects. No, not if the inducement held out had been promotion to the first lordship in the admiralty. It may rarely be conjectured whether these tendencies were developed during a youth of adventure spent in every nook and corner of the globe. Moreover, his father, who was a man of thorough instruction, omitted no opportunity to consolidate this keen intelligence by serious studies in hydrography, physics, and mechanics, along with a slight tincture of botany, medicine, and astronomy. Upon the death of the estimable captain, Samuel Ferguson, then twenty-two years of age, had already made his voyage around the world. He had enlisted in the Bengalese Corps of Engineers, and distinguished himself in several affairs. But this soldier's life had not exactly suited him. Caring but little for command, he had not been fond of obeying. He therefore sent in his resignation, and half botanizing, half playing the hunter, he made his way toward the north of the Indian Peninsula, and crossed it from Calcutta to Surat, a mere amateur trip for him. From Surat we see him going over to Australia, and in 1845 participating in Captain Sturt's expedition, which had been sent out to explore the new Caspian Sea, supposed to exist in the center of New Holland. Samuel Ferguson returned to England about 1850, and, more than ever possessed by the demon of discovery, he spent the intervening time until 1853 in accompanying Captain McClure on the expedition that went around the American continent from Bering Straits to Captain Farewell. Notwithstanding fatigues of every description and in all climates, Ferguson's constitution continued marvelously sound. He felt at ease in the midst of the most complete privations. In fine, he was the very type of the thoroughly accomplished explorer, whose stomachs expand or contract at will, whose limbs grow longer or shorter according to the resting place that each stage of a journey may bring, who can fall asleep at any hour of the day or awake at any hour of the night. Nothing, then, was less surprising after that than to find our traveler in the period from 1855 to 1857, visiting the whole region west of the Thibet in company with the brothers Schlagentweit, and bringing back some curious ethnographic observations from that expedition. During these different journeys, Ferguson had been the most active and interesting correspondent of the Daily Telegraph, the penny newspaper whose circulation amounts to 140,000 copies, and yet scarcely suffices for its many legions of readers. Thus the doctor had become well known to the public, although he could not claim membership in either of the Royal Geographical Societies of London, Paris, Berlin, Vienna, or St. Petersburg, or yet with the Travellers' Club, or even the Royal Polytechnic Institute, where his friend the statistician Cockburn ruled in state. The latter savant had one day gone so far as to propose to him the following problem. Given the number of miles travelled by the doctor in making the circuit of the globe, how many more had his head described than his feet, 
by reason of the different lengths of their radii, or, the number of miles traversed by the doctor's head and feet respectively being given, required the exact height of that gentleman. This was done with the idea of complimenting him, but the doctor had held himself aloof from all the learned bodies, belonging, as he did, to the church militant and not to the church polemical. He found his time better employed in seeking than in discussing, in discovering rather than discoursing. There is a story told of an Englishman who came one day to Geneva, intending to visit the lake. He was placed in one of those odd vehicles in which the passengers sit side by side, as they do in an omnibus. Well, it so happened that the Englishman got a seat that left him with his back turned toward the lake. The vehicle completed its circular trip without his thinking to turn around once, and he went back to London delighted with the lake of Geneva. Dr. Ferguson, however, had turned around to look about him on his journeyings, and turned to such good purpose that he had seen a great deal. In doing so, he had simply obeyed the laws of his nature, and we have good reason to believe that he was, to some extent, a fatalist, but of an orthodox school of fatalism withal, that led him to rely upon himself and even upon providence. He claimed that he was impelled, rather than drawn by his own volition, to journey as he did, and that he traversed the world like the locomotive, which does not direct itself, but is guided and directed by the track it runs on. I do not follow my route, he often said. It is my route that follows me. The reader will not be surprised, then, of the calmness with which the doctor received the applause that welcomed him in the Royal Society. He was above all such trifles, having no pride and less vanity. He looked upon the proposition addressed to him by Sir Francis M. as the simplest thing in the world, and scarcely noticed the immense effect that it produced. When the session closed, the doctor was escorted to the rooms of the Travellers' Club in Pall Mall. A superb entertainment had been prepared there in his honour. The dimensions of the dishes served were made to correspond with the importance of the personage entertained, and the bold sturgeon that figured at this magnificent repast was not an inch shorter than Dr. Ferguson himself. Numerous toasts were offered and quaffed in the wines of France to the celebrated travellers who had made their names illustrious by their explorations of African territory. The guests drank to their health, or to their memory, in alphabetical order, a good old English way of doing the thing. Among those remembered thus were Abadi, Adams, Adamson, Anderson, Arnold, Baiki, Baldwin, Barth, Batuda, Beek, Beltram, Duberba, Pimbachi, Bolognese, Bolwick, Belzoni, Bonamain, Brisson, Brown, Bruce, Brunelulay, Burchell, Burkhart, Burton, Kyland, Kylie, Campbell, Chapman, Clapperton, Clot Bay, Colomieu, Curval, Cumming, Cooney, De Bono, Deccan, Denham, De Savanche, Dixon, Dixon, Duchard, Duchelu, Ducan, Durand, Durol, Duverrier, Descayac, De Lotte, Ernot, Ferret, Fresnel, Galinier, Galton, Geoffrey, Galbury, Hahn, Halm, Harnier, Heckart, Hooglin, Horneman, Houghton, Imbert, Kaufman, Noblucker, Gruff, Coomer, Lafargue, Lang, Lafay, Lambert, Lamerel, Lampierre, John Lander, Richard Lander, Lefebvre, Blanjon, Levalion, Livingston, McCarthy, Magyar, Maison, Malzac, Moffat, Mollien, Montero, Morrison, Mungo Park, Niemans, Overweg, Panet, Parterio, Pascal, Purse, Petty, Penny, Petherick, Ponset, Prax, Refinol, Rab, Rebman, Richardson, Riley, Ritchie, Rocher de Ericourt, Rongari, Rocher, Rupel, Saunier, Speak, Stedia, Thibault, Thompson, Thornton, Tool, Tunzi, Trotter, Tucky, Turwit, Vaudy, Bessier, Vincent, Vinco, Vogo, Wahlberg, Warrington, Washington, Warren, Wild, 
and last but not least, Dr. Ferguson, who, by his incredible attempt, was to link together the achievements of all these explorers and complete the series of African discovery. End of chapter 1 of Five Weeks in a Balloon Recorded by Alex C. Talander, Davis, California www.alexheathlander.com